go. <laughs> and I'll mute everyone. Great. It's so nice to see everybody here. I love seeing your names pop up. And this is week five of the It Is Well With My Soul Bible Study. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we will jump right in. Oh, someone else is here. Okay, here we go. Father God, thank you, Lord Jesus, for your many blessings upon our lives as we look back at all that you've done for us. We are so grateful, Lord. And so we roll all of our cares and concerns over to you at your feet. And I thank you for my sisters in Christ joining me today to learn more about what it means to come to Jesus with all of our care. So thank you, Lord, for the book of Matthew and chapter 11. In Jesus' name, amen. So I made a mistake in the Bible saying I accredited this to Luke. I accredited Matthew 11 to Luke, so forgive me for that. <laughs> it is Matthew written by Matthew. Now, I do want to make an announcement, though. I was planning on this Bible study going eight weeks, but I'm going to have to combine seven and eight together because this study needs to end on August. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Let's see, not 19th, but the week before, August 12th. Yeah, we'll need to finish this up on August 12th because the next Bible study, the overview of the book of Hebrews, will begin on August 19th. So I'm going to combine lessons seven and eight together. So my apologies for that. But I'm excited because my church is going to advertise this uh, Bible study, the next one, beginning in August to the women at our church. So hopefully we'll get some more ladies signed up. So I'm excited about that. And uh, okay, so we are going to dive into Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. A very, very famous verse, right? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Isn't that beautiful? I just love that so much. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So in this lesson, we are going to look at how Jesus invited those who were burdened and tired to come to him. How can this passage apply to believers today? Are we burdened and weary? I would say, yes, we are, right? And some of it is because of things we've caused ourselves, right? So Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So back then during this time, um, the people were burdened. And in the lesson, um, I don't know if you ever hesitate to give everything over to Jesus. I know I've done that at times. I think, well, he can handle the big things, but I surely can handle the little things, right? And so sometimes we think, you know, I don't want to bother Jesus with these little things. And in the lesson I reminded my, I was reminded of how a coworker, a friend of mine, he announced one time in a staff meeting that he loved it when we asked him questions because he felt like we were honoring him. And I, I thought, wow, I didn't even think about it that way because I was asking him a lot of questions throughout the day. He was very, very proficient in Excel spreadsheets, and I'm, I'm not. So when he said that, I thought, wow, that's good to know because we thought we were bothering you. And he said, no, it honors me that you ask me to help. And then I, I, I told him how he reminded me and my students how it used to be such a thrill to see their hands go up with questions because that meant, number one, they were listening to my lesson. And number two, they cared enough to know how to learn the concept correctly. And that was just such a blessing to my heart. So I, I thanked him for opening up like that in the meeting and letting us know. Because when we take our cares and questions and concerns to the Lord, we're honoring him too, aren't we? We're saying, God, I trust you with everything, even the little tiny things and the great big things. I trust you with all of it. So you can see how that is honoring to Jesus. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So during that time, the people were burdened, and they were being oppressed from all sides. 
the Roman government and the Jewish leaders of the day. The Jewish leaders did something that they were not supposed to do. They added to the laws of God and making it to where the people couldn't possibly keep all the laws. And so they were burdened and feeling like failures all the time. And that puffed up the, the Jew Jewish leaders. They thought of themselves as, you know, high and mighty. But God was watching. He was watching the whole time. Even though he was silent for 400 years, he was still moving and keeping an eye out for his sheep because he was the good shepherd. So he knew what was happening. And so when he came, he made an announcement in the book of Luke, a very profound announcement to the people when he was of age and ready to start his ministry. He went into the synagogue. Now at the time of this in Jewish history, the synagogue was a place where the word of God was read and the adult men starting from age 13 on up had to be prepared to read the scrolls whether they were told beforehand or not it didn't matter they could walk in the door and the leader could come up to them and say today you are reading from the scrolls and they had to be prepared whether they were age 13 or 55 it didn't matter so that day jesus was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah and he opened the book and he found the place where it was written and this is a very famous passage that means it's like the Messiah speaking as to why he has come so it's like a prophecy of the Messiah who would say the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and heal the sight, give sight back to the blind, which no other prophet ever did in all of scriptures, only Jesus. To set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he stopped because the rest of that passage in Isaiah goes on to explain the next coming, what the Messiah would do after he leaves this earth and then returns. So Jesus stopped right there because that was his calling, his purpose for being on the earth at that time at age 33 to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then that was it. He stopped. He closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down in the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him because this was amazing. Now to us, we think, oh, wow, that's beautiful. But to the people, the Jewish people at that time in that synagogue, this was profound. That this young man from Nazareth, from Mary and Joseph's household, would say this as though he himself were speaking these words, not just reading them, but he was telling them, today in your presence, these passages have been fulfilled amazing he was speaking about the messiah and what he would accomplish on earth so jesus was giving them an outline of his ministry that was just getting started so when jesus read these verses in isaiah and sat down he proclaimed that this prophecy had been fulfilled in their presence he was messiah and look at the verbs that jesus used to preach to heal to recover sight, to proclaim, to set at liberty. So he was bringing hope to the oppressed, hope, hope to the captives, hope to those who were weary and who were looking for the Messiah. And to others, he caused great concern, didn't he? So let's focus on the hope that Jesus gave. God's plan. Think of the fears and anxieties you're thinking with right now. And I know you are. We all are. Whether it's financial strain or desperate for healing. Uh, we heard last night a prayer request through our church that a beloved family of uh, members of our church were out on vacation. 
in Lake Tahoe and their son fell 50 feet off a cliff and he's only 17 years old. So I asked that you pray for Luke. When I heard that, my heart was just so heavy. <clears throat> I just can't imagine what the family is going through. Talk about fear and anxiety, right? But I had to remember, you know what? God's plan is perfect and he gives us a way to handle such incredible needs as these to comfort these parents that's what i prayed for comfort them lord hold them let them know that you are near so think of the worries and cares that are on your shoulders they're heavy and i heard i heard one guy one preacher on you on youtube yesterday it was such a reminder of the days when i would be working in the building at 27th avenue in camelback and I would see someone approach, and I'd say, hi, how you doing? And this friend wouldn't even look at me. They were just looking down, and, and then they would go the other way. And I'd be thinking, oh, what did I do to her? You know, what's, what gives? Why didn't she say hello? And then, you know, the mind starts to take over. Oh, she's mad at me. And, oh, she still remembers what happened five weeks ago. I can't believe she's still holding that against me. Oh, my goodness. And then this pastor said, now let's look at what the other person's thinking. Oh my goodness, how am I going to pay that bill? We don't have the money. If I don't pay that bill, our electricity is going to be shut off. And then what are we going to do? We have kids. It's hot. The summer, you know, what am I going to do? So he said, you can see how one person, they're focusing on how what's going on in their life. And then the other person is thinking about what's happening in their life. And our perceptions just are skewed. And it helps when we go through the day remembering that everybody is dealing with some great burden. And we don't know what that is. And so to just stop and take a moment to remember that. And I was remembering all the times when I would pass someone in the hall and they wouldn't respond to my smile or my wave. And yeah, right away, I would start thinking about myself. What's wrong with them? What's up with them? What did I do to them? And uh, not realizing that maybe they were struggling with something very real. So think about the fears and anxieties you are dealing with right now. And rest in knowing that God has a plan, a perfect plan for how to handle all those cares and troubles. And that's what we've been learning so far in this Bible study. Is God capable of handling those fears and concerns and anxieties that you listed in the lesson? Yes, he is. Because he is perfect. And his plan is perfect. And when you take the focus off the fears and anxieties and you put them on Jesus, that's when you feel that rest. Now remember, when we believe the lie that God cannot handle our cares, then we begin to lose the hope, the hope that is within us. When we buy into what the world says about fear and anxiety, and when we rely on something other than God, then we can begin to feel overwhelmed. And we start to wonder, why isn't it working? You know, the doctor told me to do this, and it's not working. Why isn't it working? You know, or my friend told me to read this, and it would make me feel better. Why isn't it working? And we have to stop and think, did I call on Jesus today? Did I put his plan first above everything else? And nine out of ten times, for me anyway, the answer is no. I have a tendency to try everything else and then go to Jesus. And that's not a good plan. The best plan is to go to Jesus first because he says, come to me, right? And I will give you rest. So then why wouldn't we go to Jesus? Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. Remember he knew the people were burdened by the law. The Jewish leaders were holding that law over the people's heads like that yoke around their necks. Telling them to turn this way and to go that way and to do this and to do that. And they were becoming so overwhelmed. <clears throat> some of the Jewish people were just walking away from the faith altogether. And some were just trying desperately to keep all those laws. So when Jesus came, he was speaking to those people. 
those who had given up and those who were desperately trying to obey. He knew that they were heavy laden. So he told them, I will give you rest. And just imagine the people's faces when they heard that. Now, when we think of rest, we think laying down for an afternoon nap, right? That's the best rest. But for the people of those days, it was very different. The word used here by Matthew, not Luke, uh, is anapao, and it means to cause or permit one to cease from any movement or labor in order to recover and collect his strength. So I don't know about you, but I love it when my manager says, you know what, it's a Friday afternoon and you all have been working so hard, you can leave early today. And all of us are like, yay! It doesn't happen very often, but every great once in a while it does. And it's such a wonderful feeling. And the first thing I think of is I'm going to rest. So that's kind of what Jesus was saying. He's saying, I am giving you permission to cease from labor in order to recover and collect your strength, to renew your strength in my words. That's God's rest. So different than the rest we were thinking, right? Just napping. It's a different story when it comes to Jesus. And I shared one in the prayer group here at work uh, last week about my race in Rome where I so arrogantly thought, oh, I can handle it. I only had like 40 days to train for a marathon. And I thought, oh, I can handle it. And everything went wrong. And the Lord had to humble me and stop me and give me permission to rely upon him. So I had to ask for forgiveness, that I trusted in everything except him. So it was a powerful lesson, a very painful lesson, a very powerful lesson in humility that I needed but I cried out to God and he helped me right where I was and that's what Jesus was saying I have been watching you for these 400 years and I've seen how you've been misled and how you have been mistreated and I am here now so come to me that was the good news of the gospel we think of the gospel so much in America as you pray to receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, and that's the good news, that we are sinners saved, and we can be with Jesus and have eternal life. Amen. But sometimes when you read the gospel messages, the gospel means good news, and sometimes the good news is that the kingdom is here. Jesus is here, the Messiah. That's the good news that he was telling them. He had proclaimed in the synagogue, I am here the kingdom of God, the Messiah is before you. So that's the good news that he was sharing with them at that moment. He said, take my yoke. Now remember, they, they had this yoke, this burden on them. And he was telling them, I see that. I see it. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for what? your souls. Oh, doesn't that just sound so beautiful? He hints here that the people weren't just burdened physically, but spiritually. And he could see that. He could see them striving day after day, trying to obey these ridiculous laws. And some of them truly were ridiculous. They couldn't even like brush their teeth on the Sabbath. You know, I mean, it was so crazy how overwhelming it was. I'm surprised it didn't get to the point where they said you can't breathe on the Sabbath. You know, it was just so overwhelming. And they kept adding and adding to the laws. And then on top of that, they had the Romans there, who at any moment could have them arrested for anything. So there was pressure, and it became weary for their souls. So when we take up the yoke of Jesus and we read his words in the Gospels, we can learn his ways of handling conflict, rejection, temptation, and fear. Because remember, Jesus was God in flesh, right? But he was also 100% man. And so God in his wisdom allowed his son to be tempted by Satan himself, 
Imagine if we were out for a walk and Satan himself talked to us. So Jesus not only was tempted, but he never sinned, as we read in the book of Hebrews. He was the perfect high priest in that he was flawless, tempted yet without sin. So he understood. He also handled conflict beautifully. Remember when the Jewish leaders came to him and said, is it lawful for us to pay taxes? And Jesus looked at them knowing that they were trying to trap him. And he said, render under Caesar what is Caesar's, but render under God what is God's. So he knew how to handle conflict. And of course, rejection. He was rejected by everyone, even his best friends. Can you imagine the pain of being with someone for three years and then hearing them reject you saying, I don't even know this person. Think of the pain in his heart when he heard Peter say those words. And then fear. Remember how he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, 100% man, was crying out to God in anguish. Remember, his soul was deeply distressed. So he had fear about what was to come. So God knows, ladies, God knows what it is that you are going through. So think of how we can learn from Jesus, how we can imitate his ways. They're so different than what the world is telling us to do, right? Here's a picture of a yoke on some ox. Does it look light? No. Does it look like a burden? To me it does. It looks so uncomfortable, doesn't it? That's why we call these beasts of burden. And this yoke was used to make them go left and right at the owner's whim or straight ahead. But these beasts are not free to do whatever they want unless that yoke is removed. So Jesus said, once we remove that yoke from our shoulders, you're going to feel relief and liberty. Can you almost feel it being removed from your shoulders? The end of the day, when that yoke is removed from those poor oxen, just think of the relief they had. So what are some practical ways you can take up the yoke of Jesus, who said his yoke is light? You know, his yoke is easy, and his burden is light. Now notice he didn't say, come to me and I will remove the yoke. And you will never have to wear a yoke again. He didn't really say that, did he? He said, put on my yoke, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So how can we take up the yoke of Jesus? I was thinking, you know, definitely by being in his word every day and studying how he handled conflict and temptation and fear and reminding ourselves of the Psalms and how those prayers of anguish were answered by God. So that is how we can take up the yoke of Christ. And only then can we enjoy God's freedom. So we've looked at God's plan, God's rest, and now God's freedom. It's different than freedom that the world offers, isn't it? Freedom that we think is free. But really, we start to put more and more burdens on ourselves. So the yoke of Jesus is easy and his burden is light. He's giving his people permission to rest, permission to recover, right? Permission to stop, stop striving, stop working all the time. And that's why our next Bible study is going to be about the book of Hebrews. It's an overview of the book of Hebrews called Jesus, A Better Rest. Because in the book of Hebrews, the early church was starting to go backwards, back to relying on the law, on the priests, on the sacrificial system, because that's really all they had ever known. Have you ever known someone who came to Christ and then after a few years started to go back to their old ways? Because it's hard sometimes to believe in a God you've never seen, to believe in Jesus you've never known. And the early church was suffering from that. And that's why the book of Hebrews was written, to remind them of freedom, 
not freedom in the law for there is no freedom in the law but freedom in Christ so that's why I thought it would be good to study the book of Hebrews right after this Bible study so you're going to learn more about what freedom in Christ looks like and what it means so think back to how Jesus handled the harsh storms remember the storm had hit the boat was filling up with water the disciples were panicking and who could blame them? I would panic too. And they were desperately bailing the water out as it came over the sides of the boat. And where was Jesus? He was asleep in the boat. <laughs> so that reminds us of how we should handle desperate situations, of how we should handle fear. Be more like Jesus. He understood true rest during the harsh storms and isn't that what we should desire do we desire a place of true rest when our fears and anxieties rise up all around us like that stormy sea jesus is here to remind us that we have permission to partake in his true rest and rely upon him not ourselves not the world not anybody else but him we can learn from Jesus how he reacted during difficult times of fear and anxiety. And we can be more like him. I had you read about Lazarus when Lazarus died. We had looked at that in our uh, worship service on Sunday. Our pastor went through it. And as we were looking through this very pas famous passage of scripture, I was looking at it through the lens of this true rest. And I thought, wow. Here we have a perfect picture of how to react responsibly when we hear of something difficult and how to respond. When Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he didn't overreact and say, come on, let's go see him. He responded and he didn't respond with fear. And when, they, when his disciples told him, you know, if we go back to Jerusalem, they're going to kill you. And Jesus didn't say, oh my goodness, you're right, let's go somewhere else. He reminded them of what his mission on earth was, and that was to die. And so when he heard a few days later that Lazarus did die, that's when he said, let us go, for Lazarus is sleeping. And his, friend, his disciples said, he's sleeping? Oh, well, then we can go wake him up. And he said, no, Lazarus is dead. Let us go. And then that's when Thomas said, we should follow him. Bye, Cindy. We should follow him. And if we have to die with him, then we will die too. So it shows you their faith and their trust in Jesus. So when his friends, Mary and Martha, saw him coming, they ran up to him and said, you know, Lord, Lazarus is dead. But I know if you had been here, he would still be alive. And Jesus reminded them of who he is. In one of those powerful I am statements, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, even though he die, he shall live again. There's that hope. So we see the beautiful picture of how Jesus handled hearing news of his friend's death. He didn't overreact. He responded with peace and calm, always remembering the Lord's plan. And so he was seeing how God was going to use this time for glorification of the Son on earth. And so even though he was filled with sorrow, as he saw everyone around him weeping and mourning Lazarus, Jesus himself wept and grieved. His friend had died. But then he uses this as an opportunity to teach. And so he prays before raising Lazarus from the dead. Why? He said, Father, I want them to see that you have sent me, that they would believe. So he always wanted God to be glorified by his actions. So when he did raise Lazarus from the dead, all the glory went to God the Father. So how did Jesus react and respond to the death of his friend Lazarus? With peace with true rest, honoring God 
by giving him all the glory and the thanks. Isn't that how we are supposed to respond when we have great sorrow, great pain, great suffering? We have the perfect example in scripture to follow. True rest. So what did Jesus do that we can imitate in this passage in John chapter 11? Well, we can remember to respond and not to overreact. We can remember that God doesn't always want us to do something immediately, that his plan is perfect, and we can trust the plan as Jesus did. And then, of course, we can grieve with those who are grieving. We can weep with those who are weeping, never losing the hope. Jesus never said, oh, it's hopeless, oh, no. Instead, he grieved with them, he wept with them, but he never lost the hope, did he? Always hold on to the hope. So during our great time of loss and grief, we have that advocate, remember? Jesus responded and didn't react. He had faith. He kept the faith. He trusted the Father. And he used the situation to point others to God. That's what we can do. Yes, we can do this during difficult times of great stress and fear, times of loss, whether it's loss of a job, a home, a friend, a marriage, a child. It doesn't matter whether you're afraid of the financial insecurity or, you know, what's going to happen next week. We can point others to God by our reactions and our response to great times of fear and anxiety. How does imitating Jesus help us feel anxiety and fear in our lives, right? Help us feel it less. It lessens the fear, doesn't it? Because we're keeping our mind on him. We're keeping our focus on him. And that's where that true rest for our souls comes from. Come to me, Jesus said, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart like that shepherd, right? And you will find rest for your souls. So you can see how Jesus, being the good shepherd, understood the importance of rest. Just like in Psalm 23, David wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not, rest, I shall not want, for he maketh me lie down in green pastures. He understood that sometimes the shepherd has to make the sheep rest. And that's what Jesus was saying. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's not like the yoke that is put on you by the Romans and the Jewish leaders, he's saying. So reflect on everything we've learned so far. Remember, we've learned about the power of God is in us. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you and that peace of god is inside of us too remember the prayer of hannah remember her story she cried out to god and he remembered her he heard her and he answered her and then remember jesus is our advocate he gave us the spirit the holy spirit comes next to us and supports us during difficult times the spirit of god the power of god lives in you. So reflect on some of the takeaways you've gathered so far in the five weeks of this Bible study and focus on those. And what have you learned about the very character of God? I've learned that he is immutable, unchangeable. He's the same God that parted the Red Sea, the same God that provided for his children in the wilderness, the manna and the water. He's the same God that rose Lazarus from the dead and Jesus on the third day, and he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He is eternal. So his character is, he never changes. His character is that he is just, and hope, and love, and holiness for all eternity. So we can put all of our trust and cares at his feet at all times, even during times of great struggle where your soul is deeply distressed, like Jesus, he understands. He's been there. So how can we apply this? 
What are some goals you have for growing your relationship with God the Father this week? Maybe cry out to him more often, even with the little things, not saving it up for the great big things. Or maybe it's trusting him more, relying more upon him than others. Or maybe it's just being in his word more often, every day, memorizing it, treasuring it in your heart. I know that's something I need to work on. Maybe it's telling others what you've learned so far about God in this study. Maybe you know someone who desperately needs to hear this kind of hope, that there is true rest for the believer, true rest in Christ when you come to him, those who are weary and heavy laden. Come to Jesus, all of us who are weary, and he will give us the rest we so desperately seek, right? Thanks, ladies, for joining me today. You are a blessing to me. Take everything you've learned so far in this Bible study, true rest for your souls. And I will see you next time for Lesson 6. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you, Father, for Matthew 11, these beautiful verses that remind us of who you are and how we can come to you for that rest, that true rest, and that we're just so honored, Lord, that you are the good shepherd, that you are gentle and lowly, and that you can give us true rest for our souls, that you look at us and you see that we're not just physically burdened, but deep down inside, you know that we are spiritually burdened. So I pray for my sisters who are here today, Lord. You know what they're struggling with. You know what is definitely a burden to them. Remind them to put it at your feet to come to you for true rest and to imitate you how you handled everything, rejection and conflict and pain and grief. You handled it in a way that is perfect so that we can rely on you. Thank you, Lord, for bringing each lady here today to hear this message. Remind her how much you love her and that you walk with her as her good shepherd every single day. Thank you for reminding me of this fact as well. Lord, we pray that you are blessed. We always pray that you are blessed. And it is in Jesus' name we pray right now. Amen. Thanks, ladies. Good to see you again. Hi, Shelly. Bye, and I will see you next time. And remember, we're going to combine lessons seven and eight together. Uh, so that way we can start the next Bible study on August 19th. And I'll, I'll send out that reminder too. Bye, ladies. Have a great rest of your lunch hour. You're welcome. We'll see you next time.